Welcome to Fiction Fans, a podcast where we read books and other words, too. I'm Lily. And I'm Sarah. And tonight we will be discussing Hell's Eight by Stark Holborn, the sequel to her earlier novel, Ten Low. But first, Sarah, what's something great that happened recently? Something great that happened recently was that yesterday my power went out for five hours. And on the face of it, that doesn't sound like a good thing. But it was a good thing because it meant that I didn't have to do any work and could sit around reading Hell's Eight instead. And that was lovely. I liked that quite a lot. That is delightful. I uh, This isn't my good thing, but I started reading this book like when I was headed to bed one night and then stayed up until like four in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Responsible? No. <laughs> Sign of a good book? Yes. Yes. No, my good thing is that one of my old professors was in town for a conference, and we caught up, which was really, really nice. Did you actually? I know we had talked about how you had planned to. Yeah, yeah, it worked out. We got breakfast one day before the conference started. Nice. Which was like the only time all the schedules aligned, but (laughs) it happened. It was delightful. I kind of assumed, because I didn't hear anything about it from you, that it hadn't happened or wasn't going to happen, Mm. but... I mean, there's not much. I've, it was very indulgent. I got to like tell him how looking back, my college experience was incredible, and he was such a huge part of that, and like schmoopy shit like that. <laughs> and then also, we got to like banter about work, like equals, which was a fun experience. Nice hearing about the trials of trying to teach over Zoom. I'm glad that it worked out. Me too. It was yeah, really nice. Well, Sarah, what are you drinking this evening? So I did try to see how easy it was to get palinka, which is a fruit brandy from the Carpathian Mountains that's mentioned quite a lot in this book. And the answer to how easy is it to get, at least at the last minute, is not easy at all. Yeah, BevMo doesn't just have it on the delivery app. (laughs) No, BevMo does not have it on the delivery app. I can order it online, but... Not from anywhere that's going to get it to me the same day. Mm, Bummer. So instead, I am drinking plum-infused vodka because I figured that's close enough to a plum brandy to count as palinka. Sure. Yeah, sure. (laughs) Closer than what I got. What are you drinking? I am drinking the hair of the cat, which is the wine that my husband and I make with grapes from our backyard. And we're still processing all of it from last year year from last fall. So I have the dregs that didn't fit into the bottles when we were bottling it. I am finishing off. I'm helping. (laughs) That is very helpful. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You're just making sure that nothing goes to waste. Oh, actually, though, yes. The dregs from, I forget all of the fancy wine terms, when we're filtering it out to make sure there's no solid grape dust Mm -hmm. left in the wine. There's usually a couple inches left that, like, we don't want to keep to make sure that the bottles are, like, super clear. But there's too much to throw away, so we do end up drinking some muddy grape dust wine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little chewier than I want, <laughs> but it still tastes good. Yeah? Well, I will say this. I have not read anything other than <laughs> the book we'll be discussing tonight. How about you? I have. I mentioned in our last episode that I was reading Exit Ghost by Jennifer Donahue, and I finished that today, actually. I really, really enjoyed it. There was one plot line that I kind of wish had been explored just a little further, like what Jenner's deal was. But otherwise, it was a fantastic exploration of like grief and revenge. And I really, really enjoyed it. Awesome. Breaking news! Our top secret sources say that the plotline does, in fact, get resolved in the next book. Which, coincidentally, resolved is the word Sarah was looking for. Well, (laughs) I really enjoyed Hills 8. It is a sequel. Probably would have helped if I remembered anything about Ten Low. Yeah, I have to admit that I don't remember anything about Ten Low, except that I enjoyed it. I was thinking, wow, I really don't remember like stuff so much so that we must have read this like a year and a half ago. And then I looked it up on Goodreads and we read this book like nine months ago. (laughs) And that is way sooner or way shorter of a time between then and now than I thought it was. 
that is the problem with books in a series coming out so far apart from each other. I mean, actually, when you think about it, like for a series, these books came out in remarkably short order. Yeah. So you're saying that the concept of a series is fundamentally flawed. No, <laughs> but we're not going to get into this argument because we've had it already. All right. I did think I'd just, you know, slip that in there, though. No, no, you are wrong, but we will agree to disagree. I do think, though, that Hell's Eight, for all that it is a sequel, it also stands up pretty well on its own and does a fairly good job at giving you, like, enough context for what happened in book one that if you're like me and can't remember a damn thing, you do okay. So I agree with you. I do feel like I remembered Tenlo as I was reading it. Like there were some characters that get reintroduced in Hell's Eight that I won't talk about right this moment, that when they are back on the page, I was like, oh, hell yeah, that's right. That person exists. They were like a main character before. And I, I think that actually goes to my point about this book giving you the context for them. Yeah, but I don't know how much is me having my memory sparked and how much of it is plenty of context in the book. Mm, I see. I agree that there is probably plenty of context in the book, but I don't think we are the right case study because we had actually read it. I mean, I'm, I'm to be clear, I'm not suggesting that you read this book without reading Ten Low. I kind of would love as an experiment for someone to do that. To read them in the other order, like read Hell's Eight first and then Ten Low second, because, okay, hear me out. This book gets to focus so much on world building because we're interacting with established characters. We don't need to learn who Ten is because we already know who she is. But like, how fascinating would it be to get all of the world building first and then go read about all of these characters that you just saw go through hell and back? Hit <laughs> hell? I did make that joke to myself almost every page while I was reading this. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting thought experiment, yeah. Yeah, it would it would definitely be an experiment. I think the way that the books are written is the right way to do it, probably. <laughs> but it's close enough that I would be interested to know how that goes. Yeah. And I mean, to be fair, I don't think that you could do that with a lot of sequels. No, God, no. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But also, I really love the order. Yeah, ignore everything I just said. <laughs> I love the way that these two books give us the information, like the order we get the information, because I feel like a lot of times in storytelling, we get the world established and then we learn about the people in it. And now this is me just preferring character work to world building. But I really loved that we had one book that was like extremely focused to low, like very much focused on like a handful of characters and their experiences with very personal stakes, which is also one of my favorite things. <laughs> and then after that, after all of that, now we have Hell's Eight, where we can basically just use character names as shorthand. Like this person, you know, that we just spent a whole book establishing who they are. We don't got to go into it. Let's get into the crazy chance demons. And it was like, yeah, <laughs> now I can actually engage <laughs> with this world building. Yeah, I, I do feel like because of the comparatively tight focus in book one, you can broaden the scope in book two in a way that keeps readers interested. Yeah. And this was basically exactly what we said we wanted. Thinking back on our book one discussion, <laughs> we were like, no, we want a different story. We wanted to hear about 10, finding out more about the Seekers. And Stark <laughs> fucking delivered. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you're right. I don't actually remember much about our conversation about Tenlo either. But I do, now that you say that, I do remember us saying that we wanted more information about like Ten and the Seekers. And you're right. That's definitely what we get in this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was so fucking pleased with basically everything, everything about this book. This book was a lot of fun. I just, I really enjoyed it. It was, it was like... Tenlo was a lot of fun too, but I feel like I had a little bit of a harder time with it, possibly because it was weird in a way that I wasn't expecting with the ifs. And when I went into this book, like I knew what I was getting into and I was like, okay, I'm ready. I feel the same way with the added complication of these books are in first person. So starting Tenlo. 
I was already like a little bit on edge. If I recall correctly, I think it took me like up to a quarter of the first book to really be on board. Then I was like fully engaged all the way, but it was definitely slower. Yeah, all I know is that you were definitely on board by the time the train heist happened. Oh, yeah. Because I remember you texting me about the train heist. I do. Oh, I remember that. Just my all caps, train heist, train heist. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that is quite far along in the book. Yeah. We are getting sidetracked, though, with all of this talk about Tenlo, when we well, should be talking about Hell's Eight. I mean, part of it is trying to remember Tenlo, because we read it pretty long ago, when it, roughly when it came out. Is Hell's Eight out now? If you are listening to this episode on the day that it's released, March 22nd, the book will have come out yesterday, March 21st. Oh, hey, that's pretty good timing. We did do that on purpose, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is not by chance. Okay, okay, okay. So let's talk about the actual book we're here to talk about and not just reminisce about how we fell in love with the first book. Although, probably not a bad thing either. <laughs> <laughs> so Ten Lo is the name of our main character who obviously we hear all about in book one, and then we get to continue the adventures of in book two. Who's Hell's Eight? Okay, so I'm pretty sure <laughs> that Eight was Esther Hazy. Her name in prison was Eight, because they're named by their sentence length. Yeah. I guess what really fucked me up, uh, a, a couple of things, but in this particular case, it's Hell is the name of a character, uh, sort of a mythological figure almost. And so the title of the book is Hell's eight, like the eight belonging to hell. And that just kind of hits the Ocean's Eleven part of my brain. So I kind of kept waiting for there to be like a group of eight people. <laughs> and I was like, where where are Hell's eight? Like, where are they? <laughs> and until you said, Lily, it's the person named eight. I was like, oh, that does, that does make sense. There's also a lot of eight imagery in this book. And then you also get how, like, you know, there's an eight and then there's an infinity symbol on two sides of a coin. And it's like, how the hell? Like, that's a joke, right? Being able to tell those apart. <laughs> <laughs> Except that in one case, the infinity symbol is designed like an Ouroboros. So, yeah, the Ouroboros is infinity and the other one is an eight. But without that... Infinity and eternity, as yeah. they say. Yeah. I mean, it is a joke because they're nominally different but basically the same and choice is fake is a theme in the book so yes it is a joke but also <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like star colborn put a lot of thought into the title of her book and it shows up a couple of other places too so it is it is just like a i don't know recurring imagery concept i'm not going to call it a theme it's just a number but <laughs> <laughs> it's a recurring thing yes it makes me wonder, I'm going to say this very vaguely because we're not in the spoiler section yet. There is a group of people we see in flashbacks. Is that group of people, are there eight of them? No, I don't. We never actually sit down and count them. There's not to start with. Well, then there's not to end with. But at some point in the middle, there probably was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. At least I don't think in any way that matters yeah i don't i don't i don't think so but that was the kind of stuff i was looking for because i was expecting a group of eight people just because the title pinged oceans 11 in my head and so that was just like something i was stuck looking for the whole time even though it was completely irrelevant that's on me <laughs> yeah i that's not a problem that i had i have to say yeah that's fair <laughs> another problem that i had that is probably mostly a me problem, but I don't think entirely. So the ifs, the chance demons, are referred to as they in the book. Like, people don't want to say their name because they don't want to summon them because it turns out chance chaos demons cause all sorts of bullshit. <laughs> Who'd have thunk it? I know. But that does mean every time they're referred to, they're referred to as they in italics. <laughs> And just my, like, mental narration started to get real silly. They don't control the future. They only allow us to see. They. <laughs> Again, I think this is mostly a you thing. Not, not to say that other people wouldn't necessarily have that same response. But it's not something that stood out for me. <laughs> I don't think it's entirely a me thing because italics are often used for emphasis. Right. Well, which is why I said that I don't think it's only 
like okay. Okay. solely a you thing just that I don't think it's quite as big a thing as you did I had to like consciously not read it like that because it just started to sound it sounded sarcastic when I read it like that which was is clearly not the intent and it doesn't read that way in the book it's just because of that extra emphasis on those words it just got out of hand yeah <laughs> in my mental narration not in the actual book narration that that wasn't an issue that I had either mm-hmm. I think that was part of what made the first book hard to get into because I hadn't you really get thrown into the world Holborn doesn't explain the world very much in the first book you pick it up over time but that's not the point and so before I figured out what the hell was going on with that I was like what is going on yeah I think the first book is a lot more confusing because as you say you don't know anything that's going on in the world and you don't even like in the first book if I recall correctly you don't believe in the ifs Mm -hmm. to start with like they're just kind of urban legends Mm -hmm. And you come to realize as the book progresses that actually they are these real things, these chance demons, that they do have an impact and they can affect what's going on. Whereas in Hell's Eight, assuming you've read the first book, which you probably should have, like you go in knowing, okay, yes, this is what's going on with these things. I think part of my issue at the time was I hadn't read any of Holborn's work before. So I was, I mean, judging about everything on the fly, right? So I didn't know, I didn't trust that it was going somewhere. Mm. (laughs) I think if this book had been, like, recommended to me by someone, instead of us reading the summary and going, yeah, that sounds fine. Like, if someone whose opinion I trusted said, hey, this book is good, and then I had read it, I think it would have been easier for me to just, like, accept this is going to get explained, don't worry about it. Mm. Because I was sitting there going, is this? Does this get explained? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it does. Yeah, it totally does. No, it's great. But that's the problem with going into a book totally blind. Yeah. It's the fun of going into a book totally (laughs) blind. But I mean, I I went into it less blind than you because I had known that I wanted to read it. I'd seen the summary, like I'd come to it independently and Mm -hmm. wanted to pick it up. So I at least had that behind me. But it's still worth taking a chance on books. I'm just saying. Yeah. You go into it differently. Yeah, that's true. I do have one brief complaint, though, not about the book itself at all, but on the back of the book, and you might not have noticed because you don't read the backs of books. Nope. (laughs) But it it does comp this book to Becky Chambers' Wayfarers series, and I've only read the first book of that, but that's a very different vibe from Hell's Eight. Like, that's cozy, and this is weird Western. (laughs) It's very specifically not cozy or comfortable in any way. <laughs> yeah. I hate that so much. It's it's an interesting choice. Both are great books, but very different. Yeah, I feel like a hypocrite because I did like the first book in the Wayfarer series, and I did like Ten Low and Hell's Eight, but I don't think those two things are related. I think that's a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, it, it just... I saw that we may have talked about this in our conversation on Temlo too. And it it always takes me aback when I see that comparison because this book is so gritty and like not comfortable. No, it's not at all. If if you picked up Temlo or Hell's Eight based on a comparison to the Wayfarer series, I think you would have a, a very bad time. I mean, to be fair, it's possible that the Wayfarer series changes drastically with book two. But I suspect it doesn't change that yeah. drastically. <laughs> Not this drastic. Like, oh my god. I just, isn't that just inviting disaster? Telling people to expect Wayfarer series and then having this very, very good book. That's nothing like it. I don't know. That seems bad. <laughs> yeah. I did think Mad Max when I read this book. Yeah. Oh, I love how all the vehicles are named after, like, mule, ox, like, Western animals. Yeah. Yeah, like, I would... Like, Western genre. You know what I mean. Yeah. Like, I would would definitely consider this a weird Western, Mm -hmm. like, as a genre. Sci-fi, but, yeah. Oh, yeah. All of the desert imagery, definitely. Definitely weird Western. Yeah. And you said gritty. 
This book is so gritty, both literally, but also figuratively. (laughs) It's something I love about it. It doesn't sugarcoat hardships. And it just, it feels very genuine. Like, yeah, if you're walking around in the desert, you're going to get sand everywhere. Like You really, you really feel <laughs> that the people who are living on this moon are struggling. Yes. And uncomfortable all the time. That is just a, yes. a theme. Like, they are pioneers. They are living on the edge of space for various reasons. The, very, this does very much fit into the, like, ethos of western i agree but it's not comfortable it's not luxurious unless you are the one rich fuck on the moon but it's that like constant reminder of how just survival is a struggle plus all the other shit they have to deal with yeah and you never forget when you're reading this that they are struggling for survival and like injuries don't just mysteriously vanish like if someone gets hurt they then like, if someone breaks an arm, they might have some crazy sci-fi medicine, but that arm still hurts for, like, a while afterwards, and that doesn't get forgotten by the narrative. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, it's just really good. I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> I did, too. Who should read this book? I'm not saying if you liked Wayfarers, you'll dislike this book. I'm just saying don't expect the long way to a small, angry planet, okay? <laughs> yes. Clearly, there is overlap. People who enjoyed both, like, were evidence of that. But just because you liked one is not does not mean de facto you will like the other, or that they are similar in any way. I think that's the problem. Is that implies similarity between the two, and that's what I struggle with. They're both science fiction novels. Okay, that's true. They are both printed on paper sometimes. Assuming you are having a physical copy, yes. Mm-hmm. But in all seriousness. Who should read this book? If you like gritty sci-fi, like we've talked about, if you like weird westerns, I think you'll really enjoy this book. If you enjoyed the first book, you're probably going to like this one even better. (laughs) These books do some really fun things with world building. And then also there's some crazy time stuff that is really well done and enjoyable. It hits on some concepts that are very nicely explored. Like, you know, the concept of choice and stuff. If you want to think, fuck capitalism. Oh, yeah. (laughs) There's a lot of that. (laughs) Yeah, if you're looking for a non-sugar-coated adventure. Adventure almost feels like too whimsical of a word. Yeah, it. this this is a lot of... It's like an action movie more than an adventure movie, I think. Yeah. I mean, ignoring the fact that it's a book, but it's it's very action-packed. I probably brought up Pitch Black when we read the first one. But I think it's much closer in genre to that movie than The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. Maybe just because it takes place on a desert (laughs) desert planet? (laughs) Is that why? No, because there's characters struggling for survival. The thing we haven't talked about, because it's hard to without spoilers, but there are some extremely, like, all of the hardships in this book is padded by some very sweet moments between characters who genuinely read like they care about each other. And I think you mentioned found family, which wasn't maybe the word that I would have used, but I don't think that's wrong. Like, I can, I can I, see that. Yeah, I, I think that found family often implies cozier narrative, but I do think that it is accurate, an accurate description of the relationships between all of the main characters. No, I was just going to say that it's because they don't actually spend that much time hanging out. But when they do interact, they trust each other. And if that feels very good. <laughs> That's because they spent all that time in the first book hanging out. That's true. Establishing the trust and really earning it. I think that's one of the great strengths of this book for being a sequel is that you can just run into a character, maybe take a second to remember what the fuck happened with them a book <laughs> ago. But then Hell's Eight can just run with it. A character can get dropped on the page, but you don't have to spend pages and pages and pages explaining why Ten Low, a fairly guarded person, is trusting this other person. You can just go, oh yeah, there's a whole book about that. It's fine. (laughs) Yeah, I I think if I would describe the first book as found family and this book is found family reunion. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Because these are characters who haven't spent a lot of time 
together in the years that have passed between the end of Ten Low and the beginning of Hell's Eight. But when they come together, like you feel that they have these strong bonds, you can feel the trust that they have for each other. And it kind of just picks up where it left off. We do need a bingo card for people betraying Ten and then becoming her best friend. <laughs> it is it is a theme. Holborn yeah, does they- make a joke about that. I think Ten yeah. makes a joke in the book. Yeah, I think Ten <laughs> makes that joke. <laughs> And I like that she makes that joke because it's true. Yeah. But first, a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by sand. It's great when it's in the correct place. To avoid spoilers, skip to 4515. Okay, so one of the things that this book does is it intersperses the... I'll call it present day narrative, which is told from Tem's point of view with these notes that Peck Esterhazy has left, like these journal entries. And those journal entries take place, I guess, chronologically quite some time ago when... I believe it's 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So long time in between the events being depicted in those notes, which Esterhazy is writing pretty much 30 years ago. And the events that are happening now. And I really enjoyed seeing the, uh, like, seeing the way those notes became relevant to the current events through meeting S or Dr. Song. Uh, No, I loved that. I really love the journal entries as a whole. They did a lot for me, just like in general, but also narratively breaking it up, forcing us to pause from the like main action storyline into this more, I would almost say, horror setting. I think that's the part that reminded me of Pitch Black because it's Mm. these people trying to figure out what happened to the people who were here right before them and that that, that, there's some overlap there. Anyway. Yeah, I could see that. I I do like the purpose that they serve, as you say, to, to kind of break up the current events because what's happening in the modern day or the current day is so action packed that it's nice to have this breather to, you know, kind of step back and figure out what's been happening in the action. And also you get this little horror bit. I can't believe you called it a breather. I thought those, (laughs) the past sections were so tense. It's, I don't, I don't think it's a breather in the sense that you're not tense because they are really tense. Just I think they're more tense than the present day stuff, just from an ambiance perspective. Ambiance, I don't necessarily disagree with you. Yeah. Pacing wise, though, yes, the present yeah. day stuff is very fast paced, whereas the notes about what happened in the past are much more slow. It's this like bit by bit, hint by hint unfolding of this mystery that just gets more and more horrifying the more you learn about it. The moment when the inmates are in their bunk room discovering all of these treasures left behind by the first group of inmates and Peck realizing that they wouldn't have left these behind. Like something very bad happened to the first group of inmates living in this room that they are now living in is just like this slow, chilling dread that I think really captures the vibe, the tone. I guess there's a, yeah, there's an actual literary term, the tone of those flashbacks. And then as they realize not just something horrible happened, but there's something supernatural, which is not like an accepted thing in this world. Like we said, the first book starts out with the ifs, the ifs. I feel so awkward saying this out loud. They, them, being just like a superstition, an urban legend. But then seeing, oh my god, the coin flipping machine that was still operating. And even and even the people in charge of them didn't know what happened. Oh, everything about the flashbacks are just designed to get me. I loved it. I loved the realization that the people who were in charge of this group of inmates, Peck's group of inmates, even those people in charge are also ex-prisoners. That was a reveal that I thought was excellent. Especially paired with the, oh shit, we're all expendable. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And I also, I also like the way that this ends up relating to the current day problem with Zoom Industries. Is that, Mm -hmm. 
That's how yeah. I pronounced it. Yeah. Well, I, I wasn't questioning Zune. I was just questioning whether it was Industries. Oh, I think there's actually like a company name, but yeah, it's just owned by Zune Senior and then Zune Junior. I think that the first one was like Plex Luther or something. Yeah, that sounds right. But I don't remember if it was still Plex Luther in the current day. Anyway, the the way that Peck's story, like through Peck's story, you learn that Zune Industries or the Zunes have been interested in the ifs and trying to figure out a way that they can use them to basically make money and how that relates to the current conflict was also just chef's kiss. Mm, I am of two minds, very different minds that don't actually conflict (laughs) with each other at all about the Zunes. Because on one hand, the idea that humans are always exploiting everything around them, it feels very, like, tragically realistic. (laughs) Yes. But then on the other hand, for fuck's sake, these are chaos incarnate. What did you expect was going to happen, you boob? <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, yeah. yeah like, but both of those are true at the same time. Actually, if it weren't for the like evil industry corporation aspect, I could see a different version of this story where it was humans. I mean, it's humans, but like people trying to like understand the ifs and see how they can like interact with them just from like a genuine curiosity standpoint and that feels very heartwarming i mean still stupid they're still chaos incarnate you boob (laughs) but the idea that just humans have the instinct to like expand and strive to understand is like really beautiful and that's just not what was happening in this book i just you know it reminded me of that (laughs) night But that is not really relevant to the Zooms. They are just gross. Yeah, I mean, that would be a nice heartwarming story, but that's not the, not the story that we get. I not I still I don't think the story would be different. I think it would end just as disastrously. No. I mean, I'm I'm just talking out of my ass. It, <laughs> the characters in this book are looking for profit. However, there is still a glimmer of that human instinct just to explore and that tiny tiny aspect of it was nice and i think we see that in the seekers because they continue to try to explore these deserts and understand the ifs from a very different angle just for the sake of it that there's these things we don't know let's find out and maybe that's what i'm getting at okay if i understand that thread much more in the seekers like i i don't think that the zune exhibit that curiosity for the sake of curiosity at all no they don't it just reminded me that that existed and then it okay. I kind of paid off when we did get humans who were trying to understand it just for the sake of under like okay scientific okay. curiosity and so that was nice because i was like yeah there are people who would do the same kind of thing but just like to know for the sake of knowledge and that's nice i mean as long as they're not using expendable prisoners in horrible trials that end in death well that's the exploitation problem that we talked about (laughs) also the way you called them the zoon made them sound like an alien species but it's just like a mom and her son who are too rich and do mean shit yeah their last name happens to be zoon (laughs) i I meant that like the zoon family okay we see the zoons kind of fucking up factus in a lot of different ways especially in the the present day moments when they're essentially waging a war to get as much control over this moon as possible so that they can control the ifs and one of the ways they do that is by hiring a bunch of thugs to just go fuck shit up to put it bluntly and then one of them gets flipped and that's just delightful <laughs> yeah i really liked roof roof ralph I'm going to call him Roof. I don't know if that's how it's rough. pronounced. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he he was a metal dog, so rough would be appropriate. They, but yes. They, yes. Thank you. They were a metal dog, so rough would be appropriate. Not a canine made out of metal. They belonged to a gang called the Metal Dogs, for clarity, for the listeners. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, for clarification. Oh, especially considering the first time we meet them, they kill Rowdy. <gasps> Yeah, I, but that's, see, that's what I love about their character. Not specifically that they killed Rowdy, because I was really mad about that. 
Rowdy for listeners, Rowdy is Tem's cybernetic dog, who's great. Yeah. He's the, he's the cutest, like protect Rowdy at all costs. I loved him so much. We spent enough time establishing how wonderful Rowdy is as Ten's like only companion for years out in the desert that I was like, oh no, something terrible is going to happen. <laughs> and it did. And it did. Roof killed for no reason. Rowdy wasn't even attacking him, them. Yeah. But all of the characters hold it against them for the entire book. And I'm glad. <laughs> yes. But I I really like that starting point. Because then we can use that to compare just how much they grow as a character. Because like by the end, Roof, Ralph, Ruff, whatever, is part of the team. And they actually like fix Rowdy for 10. Granted, they do that right before they sell her out and then almost die. But still, it's the thought that counts. I think... Roof was very well established as a dumb 19-year-old, suddenly yes. given more power than they know what to do with. Because part of their gang joining or working for the Zunes is that they get a bunch of like really fancy upgrade parts. There's a word for it that I can't remember. Well, and I could be mistaken about this. I thought that they had the part already because they have a cybernetic arm. And I thought that they had the cybernetic arm and what they get as part of the gang is just weaponry because they, one of the reasons why they try to sell 10 out is for a large bounty, which they were going to use to like pay off their debts. Mm, that's probably true. Okay. But they got a bunch of weapons and fancy yes. uh, vehicles and stuff. I mean, like they definitely get a lot more offensive capability than should be in the hands of any dumb 19 year old i'll go on the record and say anybody but yes also yes <laughs> yes anybody but especially not a dumb teenager well and also not just the weaponry but these gangs are told that they are in charge of this moon so there's also that like power, that political power there. Not only do they get to run around doing whatever they want, they are encouraged to be as shitty as possible and just make living on the moon miserable to try to get people to either team up with the Zune Corporation or leave. So anyway, all of that is to say, <laughs> I think it's very clear that they just suddenly had a lot more power than they knew what to do with and handled it badly. They power tripped. They did really mean shit just because they could. And you see, they they regret killing Rowdy almost immediately. Yes. Yeah. And that was the first like, okay, this character is redeemable. <laughs> yeah. And I loved seeing that growth. Yeah. Because it was this really nice through line through a lot of the like grittiness of the story where a lot of the characters are already like established and don't necessarily, which is I, not to say that they don't grow over the course of this book, but their growth is less dramatic. Mm -hmm. Whereas Ralph like goes through this very big change and it's very satisfying to watch. And also this plot line where he has the biggest crush on Gabby, who when we saw her in book one, she was this little child. I mean, with like a very adult mindset because of plot stuff. She was a, yeah, genetically enhanced child super soldier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But now she's also around 19 or so, and Ralph has the hugest crush on her, and it's really cute. Like, for most of the time, she couldn't give him the time of day. And constantly reminds them that they killed Rowdy, which was like, yes. <laughs> yes. And, and to see them, like, constantly pining after Gabby in the background, like, it's not, this isn't like a big thing. But just in the background, it was really funny and cute. And I really enjoyed it. Gabby does eventually come around to being sort of condescendingly fond of Roof. Yeah. I would say by the end. Well, I, I think by the very end, I think it's more, Roof sacrifices themselves almost. I mean, they, they sacrifice their cybernetic arm. They put themselves at great bodily harm. Yeah. To help Gabby and Ten like get the big bad at the end and i think that really made gabby respect them yes and on a different level 
I agree. And I like, I think until then, Gabby was, like you say, very, just very kind of condescending. Well, in a way that is very consistent for her because yes. her background is so rigorous is not the right word. Harrowing? <laughs> <laughs> Harrowing is appropriate. Yeah. References that she led a, like a troop into war for the first time when she was eight or like some awful shit like that. Yeah. I mean, she's got this horrible backstory. And so she's never really able to identify with people her own age. That's something that we see in the first book as well. And so her dismissing Roof as just being someone my age and therefore decades younger than me, <laughs> like, fits really well. That doesn't, like, I am i don't know why I'm trying to convince you. You know what I mean. I do know what you mean. And I agree with you. Yeah. Like, it, it seems very appropriate to her character. But it also seems appropriate that when Ralph sacrifices their hand, that would make her take a second look at what they have to bring to a relationship. Yeah. Not that we ever see them in relationship, but like you do get the feeling by the end of the book that there's potential there. I mean, I would take a step back and just say she maybe respects them as a person <laughs> for the first time <laughs> at the end of the book, thus opening the door for maybe romantic feelings someday, just that we can speculate as readers. Like that made it possible for them to ever reciprocate feelings, but I don't think we're like, even in the same eon yet yeah but also yeah it'd be cute <laughs> <laughs> yeah i just you know for a for a book that's so gritty there are some really cute relationships oh my god i completely forgot that silas existed until he gets <laughs> introduced in the fighting ring and it was like a very emotional moment because he gets brought out to fight to the death or whatever some horrible coliseum situation and Ten is like, oh, I recognize the hair. Oh my god, it's Silas. And I was like, Silas. Silas! <laughs> no! <laughs> but now I remember how much I absolutely loved their relationship in the first book. And we just get like some small glimpses of it in this one. But it is so just understated and sweet. And... They really care about each other, but don't even try to have, like, an actual relationship. It's just when they're together, they're together. I mean, it, it kind of feels, to me, it kind of feels like for all that they have spent years apart at this point, when they're back together, they're back in their relationship and they don't need to, like, talk about it. Right. Because they're just, they're just together again. These books, I feel like once trust is established, it is rock solid. And that's like a very comforting place in the middle of all of this like turbulence and chaos. I feel like, okay, I, I don't disagree with you. I feel it's because all of the characters at one point or another have betrayed each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Silas like, was the other one who sold out 10 for a bounty. And yeah, yeah I'll say in love. I think they are. <laughs> And as Ten points out, Gabby at one point, like, betrays Ten, mm -hmm. too. <laughs> so it just, it's a thing that happens, and they don't hold it against each other, which is kind of really refreshing. Well, it, I think it's very, a Ten is extremely practical. Like, yeah, a million dollars is a lot of money. Of course you're going to try to get that. <laughs> I think you have to be practical to live on that moon. But I love that that is... That that aspect of it goes both ways. Yes. It's not just the, I'm too practical for emotions, you know, that gritty in a bad way. <laughs> yeah, the, the kind of like grim dark, I'm not going to have feelings because things are going to go bad. Yeah, it's much more like people are people and they do people stuff. Yeah. And that's really nice. It is really nice. It's not nice that Ten keeps getting betrayed. <laughs> <laughs> but... It doesn't feel like a pessimistic tone. It's just very tough, realistic. Not yeah. realistic. You know what I mean. Gritty. I, yes. <laughs> Gritty really is the right word for this book. The amount of sand they have to spit out of their mouths, man. There's a lot of that. So, Lily, you have a quote that you wanted to read, yeah? Yeah, let me grab it. I don't like sand. It's rough and coarse 
and irritating, and it gets everywhere. That's not actually from this book. I'm just fucking with Sarah. <laughs> I was going to say, is that from uh, Star Wars? Yeah. (laughs) All right. Thank you for indulging me. (laughs) You're welcome. But it does feel appropriate. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Okay. I have a pet peeve. I was reading fan fiction the other day, and I came across a fic that was pretty good, like grammar-wise, plot-wise. All of that, pretty good. I was enjoying it. And then they used barley instead of barely. The word barley. Mm. And I thought, okay, typos happen. You know, I'm just going to, whatever. I'm just going to move on. And then it kept happening. And every single instance in this fic of the word barely was replaced by barley instead. So... (laughs) Like every, every single one. So he could barley see, it could barley fit. It was barley distinguishable. Barley, barley, barley. That is so distracting. (laughs) Yeah. Like, like once, like I said, typos happen twice. Okay. Typos happen. But every single time, and it wasn't just like, this isn't, this wasn't a word that just showed up in the fic a handful of times. Like it was there in a very regular way. There were a lot of Barleys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so fascinating when you find a quirk like that with an author. I mean, obviously, I think it's more common in not fan works, but um, unedited things, right? Because it's just one person. And so if that's, that, yeah. if that's their blind spot, it's their blind spot. <laughs> or they genuinely think that's how it's spelled, which is also, I mean, technically possible. Yeah, it, it's... I rarely see it happen on such a prolonged level. And Mm -hmm. to be fair, I don't think this was like, this wasn't a long fic. It was a one shot, maybe like 15,000 words or something. So not a story with multiple chapters, but I did kind of wonder like, is this their computer? Like word autocorrecting or something? Because I never see it happen this often in one fic. Yeah. What is the once is an accident, twice is a coincidence, three times is a pattern. If someone makes the same error three times, I'm like, you just think that's correct. This isn't a mistake. You think that's how it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, three three times is enemy action. I have I have stumbled across that before. The one that I remember the most, just for general hilarity was an author who spelled the word waste like the word waste. So uh in which direction are we talking? <laughs> the hilarious gross one. <laughs> <laughs> and it was of course a romance. So every time he grabbed her by her waist, it was like <laughs> <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> really uh ruined it entirely. <laughs> yeah. That's that's a little uh, bit of a grosser ruin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the mental image there. I mean, at least with barley, that's a delicious grain, right? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, similarly, you can't take a story seriously if you're being pulled out every single time. Yeah, like no, absolutely. That is, it makes it so hard, and especially when a story would otherwise be very enjoyable. Something mm-hmm. like that is like, ugh. yeah. Anyway, that's my pet peeve for this episode. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Fiction Fans. Come disagree with us. We're on Twitter and Instagram at FictionFansPod. You can also email us at FictionFansPod at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And follow us wherever your podcasts live. We also have a Patreon where you can support us and find our show notes and a lot of other nonsense. Thanks again for listening, and may your villains always be defeated. Bye! Bye.